General Ham, General Swan, thanks uh, for the opportunity again. Uh, this really is a great panel that we have for you today, and I'll, say, I'll put it sort of in these terms. As I was reading through their bios last night, by the way, it's on, it will be on the AUSA website. I encourage you to go down there and read the bio of each and every member that's on this S&T panel focused on the future of Army aviation that we know is so very important. But what we have today is really this. You have the requirements generation and requirements validation key person that's on this panel. You have the research and development science and technology person on this panel. You have the PEO PM lead that's working all the strategies for acquisition and resourcing. And then you have four key industry partners that are focused on building hardware and software solutions in support of the future of Army aviation. So as I looked at this last night, it really is the A-team. I'm gonna quickly introduce our panel members. I'll start with Jeff Langout, who is the director for U.S. Army Aviation Missile Research Development and Engineering Center. Uh, Jeff executes aviation and missile technical research and engineering programs and demonstrations. He is the top civilian authority for engineering uh, and the expert on research and development for aviation. Previously in his role, he was the AED, which was the airworthiness authority for the Army as well. Now, I'm not sure this is legal, but Jeff has engineering degrees from both Auburn and Alabama. So I, you, you got to declare. <laughs> Alabama Hunts, yes, UAH. Next, we have Colonel uh, Thomas von Eschenbach, who is the Director of Capability Development and Integration Directorate at Fort Rucker. Uh, his role involves requirements generation and all the way to the path of requirements validation. Tom previously served as the Director of TRADOC Capability, the TRADOC Capability Manager for Unmanned Aircraft Systems. He has held numerous command and staff assignments throughout his career to include uh, time as, as a deputy director for G3 Aviation on the Army staff. He has a bachelor's degree from two Tiger Universities, Auburn and ICAF. So Tom, welcome. Uh, I repeat <laughs> go Tigers. I said that for all my Alabama fans out there. Uh, Chris Van Buten is the vice president for Sikorsky Innovations. Chris runs a group responsible for maturing next generation technologies, including X2 and defining next generation products. He's been engaged in conceptual and preliminary design of Sikorsky products to include the S92, CH53K, and the UH-60M Black Hawk helicopter. Chris holds a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from University of Maryland and a master's in systems design and management from MIT. Keith Flail is Bell Helicopters vice president for advanced tilt rotor systems. He is responsible for developing and executing Bell's efforts to design and produce the next generation of tilt rotor craft systems to include the V280 Valor and the V247 Vigilant. He is a graduate of West Point, spent 21 years in the Army in various command, staff, and acquisition positions. He has a master's degree in industrial engineering from the uh, University of Me or Mexico State University. Chuck DeBundo is the Boeing Company Vice President of Cargo Helicopter Programs and the H-47 Program Manager. In this role, he leads production and modernization efforts for the U.S. Army and Special Operations Chinook Programs. Uh, prior, Chuck was the Vice President for Engineering and Chief Engineer for all of Boeing military aircraft. He, owes bachelor, he has a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Drexel University and a master's in mechanical and aeronautical engineering from Princeton. Mike Sousa uh, leads the GE Aviation Advanced Turbo and Shaft Programs and has primary responsibility for the T-901 engine supporting the Army's ITEP program, which we heard a lot about this morning. Mike has over 30 years of experience in aircraft engine industry. He successful, successfully managed several GE advanced technology programs to include the Army's Advanced Affordable Turn, Turbine Engine Program. He has a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from the University of Massachusetts and two master's degree from Northeastern University and Boston College. You know, I, I think we couldn't ask for a better panel chair for the meeting today. Uh, General Todd uh, is our panel chair, uh, and it's if you look at his background and his experience over several years, it's not just his current role or the role he had previously as a deputy commander of RDECOM, but he's had a long history of staff acquisition and command assignments. He's currently program executive officer for aviation where he runs 
all of Army aviation programs. Thomas previously served as a Deputy Commanding General of Research Development and Engineering Command. He has a long history, as I said, of operational and staff and acquisition assignments. He's a maintenance test pilot. Uh, he has a, a vast amount of experience in acquisition. I'll just mention a few of them. Patriot Missile, Comanche, Defense Contract Management Agency Special Programs, which are the classified side of what DCMA does, Air Warrior for PEO, Soldier, CH-47, and most recently he was the program manager for the Utility Helicopter Project Office. He also served a tour in the Army staff on ASALT as a director of aviation, where you work for the best boss you ever had. Uh, that would be me. But, uh, and even though Tim Crosby's out there somewhere, I know uh, that's good. But anyway, I'll turn it over to uh, General Todd, and he'll walk us through the panel. Thomas? Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Thanks for uh, that kind introduction. Certainly, uh, for now, anyway, you were the best boss I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, it really was a pleasure to work for you up there. Uh, it is a tough job in the Pentagon, uh, and thank you for your service up there as well. It meant a lot to us. Uh, there were a couple things addressed earlier in the day that, quite frankly, don't have anything to do with s and but my name was called out. Uh, I'll try to, during, the, during the, uh, the, the time we have, address some of those. However, I do want to stick to what we were, we've been asked to talk about on this particular panel, and that's science and technology. Um, we are not in this effort over the next hour going to fix acquisition, if you will. Um, there it is always something that has to be worked on. And I'm glad to be asked to be part of the S&T panel specifically because over probably the last six years of my career, I've become more aware of the value of science and technology investment. And uh, so I have a few opening remarks, but uh, looking forward to a lively discussion and uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and start with these. So again, General Phillips, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Uh, it's obviously my first time to be here at this uh, venue and on this panel, but uh, I certainly look forward to talking about science and technology for future Army aviation operations. Having spent uh, several years in PO Aviation, as well as uh, Research Development Engineering Command in AMC, I can tell you that this is an extremely critical subject given the increasing complex environment in which we find ourselves today. s and is absolutely on the critical path to a successful future in aviation operations. The mission of s and community is really to identify, develop, and demonstrate technology options that inform and enable decision makers to provide capabilities for the soldier. What we are doing is not really providing technology that's how we take care of the soldier, but what we are doing is really providing a capability for the soldier. So make no mistake about it, those involved in science and technology view their job, despite their distance maybe from the tip of the spear, is tremendously important. Mm -hmm. As we face broader and more lethal threats, the complexity uh, and the ability to, to develop uh, complex technologies and transition them into capabilities becomes more challenging than ever. As threats are also become more agile and adaptive, the need and importance of developing those capabilities uh, effectively and efficiently uh, is now more important than ever. To quote General Milley, our Chief of Staff, whatever overmatch we enjoyed militarily for the last 70 years is closing quickly, and the United States will be, in fact, we already are, challenged in every domain of warfare, uh, space, cyber, maritime, air, and, of course, land. It's no secret that in Army aviation we are challenged with a continuously aging aircraft fleet. With a large fleet counting unmanned systems in excess of 5,000 aircraft designed mostly in the 60s and 70s with upgrades, we've done an outstanding job of upgrading our fleets and inserting technology to get the most capability out of our current platforms. However, we are starting to hit what are essentially physical boundaries uh, with the capabilities we can achieve with the current platforms we have. Uh, increasing modifications and obsolescence challenges also plague us with some of those aircraft. In order to acquire, again, capability uh, provided via technology uh, needed to fight in future wars, we need platforms with improved reach, protection, and lethality. Technologies matured through uh, the joint multi-role Technology Demonstrator s and program are critical to developing future vertical lift, as many of you have already heard today. 
Advancements in S&T are also being used to develop many of our unmanned aerial systems as well in our manned unmanned teaming concepts. So it asks that you, when you think about autonomy, you largely think about the way we've done it with the unmanned aerial systems, but you also start thinking about autonomy of what are traditionally manned platforms as well. And we've heard a little bit of that discussion uh, thus far today. S&T programs go well beyond platform level developments into every aspect of aviation. Our diverse portfolio is enabling capabilities such as engines and drivetrains, rotors, vehicle management, aircraft survivability, sustainability, weapons and sensors. As advancements continue in these areas, we can begin to develop capabilities such as uh, operation integrated visual environments, which as many of you know is a very difficult uh, problem to solve. There's nothing e easy about that environment. Uh, better performance in high height conditions, modularity, and interoperability through open architectures and autonomous operations. These advanced capabilities are critical to closing capability gaps and giving us overmatch. Balancing readiness with building the future force is an exceptional challenge. Not only does it take a lot of time and resources to develop new capabilities, but that also means our current aircraft will remain in the fleet for years to come. Something we did talk about earlier was the amount of time it takes to replace a fleet of aircraft. And it quite frankly is a math problem. If your fleet is 2,135 strong, it is going to take of continuous production at almost max production, production rates 40 years to turn that fleet over. So we have to ask ourselves, do we really want to continue to put ourselves in that box? And we have heard earlier today uh, some comments about reducing uh, fleet sizes and, and potentially procuring less, maybe more MDSs, but less quantities of each. And I argue that is one way to certainly get after it. Um, in order to succeed, we need to be strategic as we move forward in developing capabilities. It ent entails keeping a close eye on threats, identify focus areas, being effective and efficient with our transitions, and you'll hear about that today, technology transition, hopefully, and rethinking our traditional processes. A focus on system level capability certainly is key to the successful development of our future aviation force. Aviation is an enabler to the overall Army. Instead of focusing on advancement of individual technologies and capabilities uh, of platforms, it's imperative that we envision how those developments operate together as a system and how the user plans to employ them. Because quite frankly, if I develop a system different than the user plans to fight it, it really was of no utility. And so we always have to be asking the question, exactly how do you plan to use the technology we're about to provide? We can both inform that as well as learn from uh, what, the, what the user plans to do with them. The ultimate goal is to develop an integrated system level capability for the commander to use in the warfight, because ultimately we are all about supporting the soldier. In, lastly, in PO Aviation, we recognize the importance of S&T to future operations. We have recently stood up a future operations team to focus on identifying new technologies that the s &T community is working on and quickly transitioning them into capabilities for the warfighter. Uh, within that effort, we are looking from a systems perspective to integrate PO Aviation efforts across PMs as none of those capabilities operate in a vacuum. We're also looking to synchronize our efforts better with our stakeholders in the user and s and community through improving collaboration. That is one of these things that this, this future operations cell is really built to do. It's not, not built to take over science and technology. It is built to create that connective tissue that we should always have and should always be synchronized with our partners in s and uh, We are working uh, to enable decision makers with better tools to understand the cost of capabilities as we make those value propositions about going forward and operational impacts. We are also focused on changing the way we approach technology transition, uh, and I'll be happy to talk about this a little bit more in the future, and development through earlier transition planning and pre-production prototyping. We're beginning to employ fundamentally different approaches such as other transaction authorities and certainly earlier collaboration with industry. Uh, ultimately, we're, we are looking to do everything we can do uh, using the authorities that we have been given uh, to become as creative as possible to provide capabilities as soon as possible. 
We'll work to continue to do that, to make sure that we transition technology where the Army makes key decisions and prov provides resources. And uh, certainly look forward to the panel. Uh, again, thanks to each of them for joining us, uh, and thank you, AUSA, for this opportunity. Joel Cotton, thanks. Jeff. Hey, thanks, sir, and it's a pleasure to be here. So, you know, as I've listened to what's been going on uh, today and trying to balance that with where I think we have, so, so Dr. Lewis right there, front row, thanks for being here, Bill. Um, you know, he's the, he's the air portfolio manager for, for the Army, right? So he does that for, for General Winds at RDECOM. And so he's, he's just had a tremendous leadership role in ensuring that what we're spending our aviation S&T dollars on gets after what it needs to get after. And so when I look at our priorities, right, so the priorities that, that Bill has, is, is executing is obviously all the things that go with JMR, right? So we've talked about that ad nauseum, right? We've talked about that quite a bit. But it's not just JMR. It's the air vehicle. And, sir, it's what you were talking about this morning, which is getting after the backbone and the openness and, you know, how does face fit into all of that? All of that kind of stuff, we're working that. So, so I feel like I can check that box and say we are getting after the things that you wanted to get after as far as, as far as the JMR piece. Then you get down to the next level of priority for us, and it's the degraded visual environment. You've already talked about that. Um, you know, I've got some thoughts on degraded visual environment and whether, you know, and, 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 and how, we're, how we're doing that, but that's clearly um, a priority. Well, that, that's, that's our, our next in line priority. And as you go down from there in, in our top, you know, top three or four, um, after that, of course, we want to pay attention to the, to the you know, 200 horsepower small engine, right? It needs to run on the heavy fuel and because and, uh, that's, that's our future and, and what's, what's the next UAV going to look like. So after listening to the discussions this morning, I feel good. I mean, this, you know, just to hear from a, an objective group of folks, I feel good that we have we're putting our money where we need to to get after the things that I've I've heard today. Now break. I heard one thing just a little while ago that I'm I'm wondering whether we're we're doing the right thing, and that was uh, General Tate, sir. I think I heard you say um, my words. Um, we need to have the capability of of a hellfire on an airplane, but it needs to weigh a whole lot less and be really nasty. And so when I look at my lethality portfolio, I'm thinking. Where am I working on that? So I might have some work to do there, sir, to, to get after. And so message, message received. So, um, so I think overall, I think we're, um, I think we're on point in doing doing what we're supposed to do from an S&T perspective. And Dr. Lewis, thank you for your leadership. Thanks, Mr. Langhout. Colonel von Eschenbach, welcome back. Thank you. All right, so for the record, I did not ask to be on two panels. And, um, and AUSA didn't offer a lifetime membership for two panels, so I, a donut. Okay. Um, so I would just, I'll be brief. And I, I would probably say in, in looking at all the things that we do every day to deliver capability to the warfighter, um, I would probably say s and the hardest. Um, because if you look at what General Gaither said about how we develop concepts that are 15, 20, 25 years out, I mean, that's where we need to focus our S&T efforts because we know that it's gonna take a while to develop those things that haven't been looked at. It's in the science realm. We wanna turn it into moving into technology, but yet in the fast, uh, proliferation of technology, how the world is changing rapidly. I could tell you just from my time at Fort Rucker, the strategy to do, whether that's in the reach protection of lethality, has changed just within that time. So the hard part is, are we working on the right sciences and technologies to deliver what we need? Uh, and I would just offer this, and this is kind of a challenge to the industry partners who will talk here after me, and to us. And I tell you, I think the solution is a more collaborative, kind of an open systems lab where, and it, you have to break your own proprietary stovepipes here, but you know, it's not necessarily the science and technology that's out there for us. It's how we quickly integrate it onto our platforms and then put it in the hands of the user. And that is where sometimes, as stated earlier, hey, there are options out there. Industry is doing their own IRAD to, to deliver capability. But have we given them the opportunity 
and are we giving ourselves the opportunity to quickly integrate that and put that on a platform? And I'll you know, quickly use one real fast example. I know the industry partners out there are looking at lethality because they're listening to what we're saying and they're developing their solutions. Now the question is, are we doing the right things that allow them to have access to our code, to have access to our platforms, and then to rapidly integrate with that at a low cost and in a, in a short time frame? And I think that's probably the biggest challenge that we have in addition to predicting what science and technology we need. Tom, thanks. Chris? All right, I'll, I'll get the industry perspective started and, and just absolutely reiterate that the collaboration between industry and the government is how to succeed. I, I don't know if uh, charts are, are possible. I run Sikorsky Innovations. We're a part of 500 engineers at Sikorsky Aircraft that are losing sleep every day about how to mature new technology for the warfighter and our commercial customers. They're not interested in the new door latch. They're interested in game-changing technology that'll restore overmatch on the battlefield or drive profit for our commercial customers. They're young five-year gamers and drone pilots and they're 35-year technical fellows. As smart as they are though, success cannot happen in just that pocket. On programs like the Raider, we have 35 industry partner companies that are bringing their brains and investment and, and uh, technology. And then most importantly, the collaboration with the government labs, Amardec, flying new technology tail rotors, uh, zero vibration solution on Blackhawks. It's that uh, build and fly collaboration with the government and industry in the S&T community uh, that's absolutely essential to success. Just give you, we've been transparent about this for, if you could advance, for six years. We've had three technology pillars that we describe simply as speed, autonomy, and intelligence. And speed is just the, the simple one word code for a lot faster, a lot more maneuverable, half the noise, able to kick butt in the terminal area but speed is kind of the moniker for that. And for that, we flew the X2 technology demonstrator. We're flying the Raider prototype focused on FVL light, and we're excited to be teamed with our Boeing partner in bringing Defiant to flight uh, next year. All enabling, expanding the range of what's possible for the warfighter on the future battlefield and preparing for future vertical lift. Autonomy, we've always shared this icon, 210. We want to put autonomy in the airplane to augment the crew. Some call it optimally piloted. The crew's gonna be there for most of the missions, but put the uh, uh, degree of autonomy to enable flight in degraded visual environments, high workload environments, enable man-on-man -man teaming by unloading the crew and let the autonomy system take on a lot of the mission. And we're flying that on a 76, and we're building it into an OPV Blackhawk demonstrator that you'll see a lot more of next year. So in all cases, it's not about the view graphs. It's building and flying new technology enablers. And the last one is intelligence for us. There is gigs of data on every platform, and we're letting it fall on the cutting room floor. In our intelligence pillar, we download those gigs of data off the commercial fleet every night, and it's getting chewed on by an increasingly capable supercomputer cluster, and we're upping the availability of the fleet, dropping maintenance, dropping surprise, literally replacing wrenches with math. And you're seeing that in a lot of other industries. It's uh, very intense, it's a whole new field, and increasingly, you'll see it start to converge uh, with the autonomy pillar. And all are enablers for future vertical lift. But all of this, again, isn't possible without collaboration. And I, I look forward to that as, as part of the discussion as we go forward, how to even grow the collaboration between government and industry, and uh, industry and its uh, uh, the, the full network of industry partners. Thanks. Chris, thank you. Keith? 
Uh, just like the Defiant team, we, uh, Bell Helicopter and Team Valor, we're extremely proud to be uh, partners with Amerdeck on the, uh, on the JMR effort. <clears throat> and as it uh, informs requirements and reduces risk uh, for future vertical lift, uh, we really have uh, something unprecedented here, I think, in terms of anything that's ever been done uh, for the for next generation of vertical lift in terms of the investment uh, collectively with, uh, with the government and industry. I mean, we look back, it's been uh, over five years now, and it's going to be seven years of risk reduction, hundreds of millions of dollars to uh, drive out risk and to, to inform requirements. I think we... We collectively as an enterprise sit in the best position, kind of knowing where we're going for our future than we have in a really long time. Uh, speaking from the Bell perspective, I know uh, probably to the human in the audience here, every single person that has come uh, out to Amarillo, they come out with one opinion of what they're going to see, and they leave with a different one. And it's, it's always been better, and I'm sure it's the uh, same thing with our counterparts. So the, uh, the robustness of the work, uh, the, the detail that has been put into this and what it can mean uh, for Army is, is uh, critically important. Uh, <clears throat> we at Bell have uh, really focused on the technology advancement, all of the TRLs that we can possibly advance to, to accelerate the acquisition uh, for future vertical lift and get capability to warfighters, but at the same time, really focusing from the very beginning on affordability, looking at everything that we've done on this platform through the lens of affordability. Because if we put some new Gucci technology on the aircraft, but it's, it's unaffordable by the Army or by the department, it doesn't do anybody any good. So really, uh, when we look at our next generation of tilt rotor, being able to really um, take those lessons learned, uh, drive out cost, weight, and complexity everywhere in the aircraft, and really look at holistic affordability from the flyaway cost, what it's going to take to maintain the aircraft, the reliability of the aircraft. So those are the kind of things that I think we've really uh, been able to burn down the risk and, uh, and, and really inform our future. Uh, additionally, uh, a lot of discussion about the acquisition timeline and what we can do to, to compress things. There's a lot of learning that has happened between government and uh, industry. Uh, we, we talk about the digital thread and what that can mean in terms of uh, designing and building uh, an aircraft in the digital environment. <laughs> And until you're fully exposed to that, you really can't grasp the, the, the power that that provides in terms of how we do things in the cycle time and the way we contract and the way we do maintenance and the way this next generation of, of soldiers is going to uh, maintain the aircraft. We're literally you know, building the aircraft off of iPads with a 3D model that you can spin on. So no more paper. Uh, all of those things and all of those efficiencies that have come out uh, as we've gone through this process or we've had estimates of, from what we've known in the past of what we thought it would take to do this, where it's fundamentally cheaper and quicker to build the aircraft, and this is the first one. So those kinds of things, really looking at uh, affordability and what affordability means to the department and to the Army uh, is something that we have really been able to wrap into this that I don't think a lot of folks at the beginning of JMR really thought that we would get that kind of learning out of this. We would get a lot of learning about technology, but there, there's learning that's applying across the entire life cycle and across the, uh, the entire uh, acquisition process. Uh, so to that point, the, the one concern I think that we all share as industry is the fact that we collectively have uh, invested hundreds of millions of dollars to reduce risk. We put five years, which is going to be seven years into this, that the appropriate credit falls into the acquisition process so that we do this as smartly as we can, as efficiently as we can, to advance capability because our warfighters deserve it. Uh, not picking on my uh, counterparts up here, but, you know, it's, it's been a long, you know, 1975, I think, around that time frame, was first flight for Apaches and Blackhawks. Uh, and you look at where the threat was in 1975 and where we are, uh, they have advanced a, a tremendous amount, and we really, uh, it's been talked about up here, the overmatch, has been eroded, and we really got to get after this uh, and, and look forward to continuing to work with our uh, Army partners. Thank you. Keith, thank you. Chuck? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll go off of what Colonel Eschenbach said earlier, um, maybe stressing the partnership between industry and the warfighter. Um, Boeing Company spends a lot of money on R&D. Uh, we do it across a, a number of platforms. And uh, we're not always sure we're spending it on the right stuff. And the key for us is to really get in the shoes of the soldier, understand what their problems are, and then connect the brain power between the soldier and the engineer or uh, the R&D specialist to really make sure we're going after those problems and attacking them in a way that's going to be effective 
and improve our lethality, improve our ability to, you know, unlevel the playing field so that we regain the advantage we've enjoyed um, for a long time. Um, give you a little bit of a program manager perspective. You know, I'm on the Schnook program. Uh, one of the keys for me is really um, having a strong partnership with my counterpart um, so that we trust each other, so that we can really uh, understand what problems we're facing, whether it be acquisition related or technology related. And then inside the Boeing company, it helps me to be able to go back uh, because I, I compete for money. It's a tough environment inside the company, just like it is um, in the government. It helps me immensely to be able to go back and say, hey, our customer needs this. Here's their problem. Here's how we're going to solve it. Uh, we can take these nuts and bolts, put them together, and go solve a real-world problem. And at the same time, we all realize we've got to make money on the deal as well. Um, but that's what really fuels the engine that generates uh, the R&D funds that, that keeps us all going. So I would just stress for all of us to continue to focus on those partnerships and uh, to help us figure out how we connect the dots and really get the warfighters' needs into the heads of the engineers so they can have that spark of creativity to find new ways to go attack things. Um, and, you know, we're focused on a lot of the same things that have been discussed. Um, go faster, carry more stuff, cybersecurity. Um, but I would say that, you know, the devil's in the details, and we really got to get down into those details to figure out where to steer the boat next. Thank you. Chuck, thank you. Mike? So I'm Mike Souza from uh, GE Aviation, and my experience with the s and community has been on engine technology development programs. And from my perspective, these have been highly successful programs, and there's a bunch of reasons why they've been successful. And I think it really starts with the process and how open the Army propulsion guys have been to working with us, sharing their plans and their vision for programs long before they come out with the announcements for those programs, uh, what they want to do so that we can think about that with them as they're developing the plans for those programs. And collaboratively, that's a great word for, to describe what we do with the Army, is to kind of work our way through what ought to be part of those programs, what ought not be part of those programs. And we do that in a pre-competitive environment, knowing full well that there's going to be an announcement and a competition that's going to occur for that S&T program. And we're going to have to compete after we give them some great ideas as to what ought to be part of those programs. And that is part of the process and part of what we do, and we recognize that, and we, we need to embrace that kind of a, a philosophy. Once we get on contract, there's been a couple of different kinds of programs. So in the eight program, for instance, there were multiple awards for that phase of the program. And if I look at where the Army is today for ITEP, that eight program has positioned both competitors really well to compete for that program going forward, and both of us are doing everything we can to give the Army what they need for that program uh, for ITEP as they make the down select and go forward on that program. There are other times when the Army just doesn't have money to do competing programs. And they have to really look carefully at are they positioning themselves where only one guy is really going to be able to deliver that capability for the future if that's going to become a program of record, and how do they balance those requirements and constraints. But whatever, we have to work with the Army to make sure we understand what that environment is going to be, and it does take us a long time to get from the start of an S&T program to the time we get that capability to the warfighter. And one of the things we have to do throughout that process is have that open communication, just like we did be in the beginning of the S&T program, to make sure the requirements aren't evolving to the point where the stuff we're doing is not as relevant as we'd like it to be. And when we started the eight program, we had a 10-page requirements document. Today, we have a mere you know, 500-page requirement document. And that's to go into an existing helicopter. And when we go into an FVL kind of application, those requirements are not set by the helicopter today, they're set by what's going to evolve in that aircraft, and we've got to stay in communication constantly to make sure we're working on the right technologies. Um, and, and so again, that's kind of where we've been. We think it's been a very successful process, and we love working that process with the Army. It takes a big investment from the company in order to be successful in that, but when we align our needs, then we're really successful. Mike, thank you. And I think mission success, we have 23 minutes left for questions. So I have the first one. In the current environment of quickly maturing technologies, how can the Army shorten the time between, shorten the time between identification of S&T options 
and the fielding of capabilities. And I would ask General Todd that question. You mentioned OTAs and other things that allow us to do things quicker within the acquisition cycle, but how can we shorten that timeline? I'll, uh, I'll try to give a couple examples. And I think first and foremost to compliment what was just said and the collaboration that's occurred on ITEP, you know, that was actually an S&T program where we got the S&T goals right. So if you think about it, we don't always necessarily bet on the right goals. Uh, so then we have to then, as we transition into a program, modify maybe the engine needed to be a little larger, the engine needed to be a little smaller. We actually did that on Comanche. For those of you that don't remember, we actually did have flying Comanches. So people don't think we ever developed Comanches. We did, and they were flying. Uh, but the engine on the Comanche program largely came out of S&T, but we did make some changes out of it, which really amounts to a redesign, okay? And that's where we've got to stop. Uh, so we need to really try to do and take lessons learned from ITEP and uh, see if we can get the goals right. Ergo, roll the, all that hard work that's been done over the past uh, several years into what is a continuing development, vice a redesign. That's the last thing you want to do after you build a prototype. Um, I will get to uh, specifically OTAs because I do want to talk about that. But largely, um, we live in a world of fully funded programs at minimal sustaining rates. So if you hear a program's fully funded today, what that means is they're fully funded at the exact minimum. Uh, there are, as General George talked about, there's buckets of priorities within the Army. So some of those programs that are in that top bucket actually do get fully funded at the most urgent schedule and at the most urgent need. Largely, though, those that reside out, outside of that bucket to include many of our production programs as well as many of our developmental programs really are at the pace of what can we afford, not at the pace of what I could, in program management terms, call crashing the schedule. I could crash the schedule to achieve things if I could do them simultaneously. So this is where other transaction authorities or other th authorities given to us by our authorizers um, really help us out. And I think it applies specifically as the S&T community works on many different ways in which they engage uh, industry through TIAs, through broad agency announcements, through CRADAs, and many of you who have experienced those certainly understand those. The question for my community is what next? Because the goal has always been to, for us to take it to the next step. Where we have struggled is we enter into um, statutory and regulatory guidelines that are fairly traditional in nature and so we end up with a lot of drag on the programs. If we can get to a point to where uh, in program management we don't necessarily exit out of, for example, the JMR technology demonstrator into what is a fairly um, defined process where I have to then call the requirement finalized and then we can allow the next step to be taken to take us all the way up to potentially a pre-production prototype, which is something that is commonly production ready. Kick the tires on it, make a down select, and then finalize the requirement. Then we probably have it similar to how much of industry does it that acts quickly today to our customers in the commercial marketplace. Because as you know, uh, industry takes an approach of let's Let's do some things, let's see if it looks right, let's continue on, but they start with a problem statement. They don't start with a requirements document. So I, I argue that there's a potential that we could take some of our other authorities, take technology beyond tier all five, get it to where it needs to be where we can actually do an educated down select, but it's gonna take partnership with industry to do that. Now largely in the environment if we did move into other transaction authorities or we did move into other types of authorities, many of which Congress provides either on a consortium basis or on a larger basis by um, really material category, um, then we would have to really talk about how do we transition out of what is a cost share environment into a fully funded by a government environment. Because if you haven't seen the way the funding structure works within our business, it is essentially we share with you in s and we probably don't even invest the majority. I don't know, Bill, correct me if I'm wrong here, but normally we invest something, but it's not the majority. 
of the funds. So it's a true partnership. But for some reason, we immediately step to it's got to be 100% funded by the government. So there is potential for us to maybe not fund as small of a share, but maybe a larger share. And step to the process of getting to um, really mature technologies that we can make down selects on. So I, I just I will use those several things as examples. I do believe we can crash the schedule, which means uh, not necessarily wait uh, in this case for JMR to be complete before we start the next phase. Heel to toe does not work. It is not agile. It is not efficient. And uh, so so one thing that we'll be pushing within PO Aviation in support of the requirements community as they finalize some things is if we are told to move out um, and if there's a decision made uh, to move out on future vertical lift and, and a particular Cape set that uh, you heard earlier mentioned today, we're going to be ready to move out and take the technology demonstrators to the next step. Uh, that will allow, I think, our really educated users to, to as we say, kick the tires and make good, good decisions. Thomas, thank you. That's such an important question. Would anyone else want to comment on that before I go to the next one? Jeff? So, so I would say, um, unfairly, part of the reason that everybody says it takes so long to transition is because it does take time to add all of those illities, right? We heard it earlier today. I want the soldier to be able to fix it. I want them fully trained. I want the reliability. I want all of those things that got to be done for a system that's going to be out there for the next 30 years, right? That's a lot of illities that have to be addressed, and some of them cannot be done in parallel. Some of them cannot be done in parallel. So, I, so I've maintained that, um, you know, it always comes. I mean, it always comes down to money. But as you begin to transition from TRL, TRL five and six and trying to get into seven, it doesn't matter where you send the money. Give it to him, or give it to a to 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 a lab, or 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 the RCO, or the SCO, or wherever you want to give it, and say, now your job is to get a capability, this capability, to the field. <laughs> yesterday, break. I got it. It's not probably going to be ready to go from a you know the soldiers are not going to be trained. It may only work for for 50 hours before you have to have somebody in there fixing it. So it's going to require a lot of special care and feeding. Material fueling plans and all that kind of stuff won't even be dreamed of at that point. But you can have something putting kinetic energy on target if that's what you need. And in parallel, the project office is going through to some of the things that, that, that General Todd just talked about, using some of those authorities to try to put some of those things in parallel, because he's still got to build all of those illities. If you're going to sustain the thing for the next 25 years, you can't skip all the illities. And I think that's, that's where we get, that, that's where all of that time, why does it take eight years to go from there to there? And I'll get off my box. Hey, Bill, if I could add just one comment yeah. as well. Right. Um, actually, two comments. Uh, first of all, we in industry really love the idea of going faster because we make money faster once we've developed that technology. And there are many, many opportunities to do that. And, and one of the things we've been really successful over the years at is transitioning technologies that come out of an engine demonstrator program you know, upgrades of our existing products. And that really does get the capability to the warfighter sooner. And it is a way that the warfighter can feel that capability. It's not going to be a whole new engine. It's not going to be a whole new platform. But if there's ways that we can leverage those technologies, those individual nuggets, and improve the capability, that's something we have to always be looking for. The other part of trying to go faster is that part of an S&T budget has to be on things that are way far out. And if we're always too focused on what do we do to get that capability to the warfighter just as soon as possible, then we lose the capability to go try things we don't know that we can do and make mistakes and learn from pushing ourselves. And we can't eliminate that from the process. Mike, thanks. Uh, well stated. That is a critically important question. Let me go to the next question for our industry partners. Uh, are partnerships with uh, partnered nations uh, for industry helpful, and if so, uh, how? From General Swan. I'll take a shot at that one. So um, Chinook currently operated in 20 countries around the world, 
And uh, we've been selling and our customers have been operating Schnucks worldwide for 20, 25 years. So pretty good pedigree of, um, you know, basically leveraging technology that was an investment made by the United States uh, around the world. I think if you look at um, one of the keys to our longevity over time, it's been the ability for us to leverage um, funding, whether it be through the U.S. or an international customer, back into the program to develop technology and then to push that back out to all the customers that need it. And uh, just a recent example, if you look at the F program, which came to be uh, in the early 2000s, uh, the Army made a big investment to go to uh, machined airframes, um, you know, some proof characteristics on, uh, on payload. Um, that formed the basis for the F. Uh, the Canadians then leveraged off of that and built a fat tank version of the F, leveraging that machine frame technology, um, upgrading the electrical system and some defensive aid suites on the aircraft. And then that fed into the, uh, the current MH-47G variant, um, and the U.S. back leveraged what the Canadians did into the G new builds that we built in 15. So I think there's a lot of opportunity, you know, given the tight monies that are out there to really work with our allies, leverage off each other's investments, and kind of parlay that into capability for, for our war fighters. Uh, I, I would just add to that, you know, I think that spiraling really works for existing platforms. I, I just give a cautionary tale for some of the, the higher technology uh, more revolutionary concepts with the S-97 Raider, we've been interested in pursuing international partnerships and investment, but the ITAR control environment can make that extremely <laughs> difficult, almost to the point of completely debilitating. Um, so if the tech, you know, it's proportional to how advanced the technology is um, but if you've got a revolutionary capability that's going to provide significant overmatch capability for our warfighters, it comes under extremely stringent ITAR control. And, and I think uh, there's fertile ground in a little more policy work and, again, collaboration on what are those relationships that are, that are kind of win-win-wins with a trusted partner country, uh, you know, U.S. DOD and the export control policy and industry. I, I think there could be fertile ground there, but currently it's very difficult. Yeah, I think it's a it's a typical it depends answer. So uh, Australia, Australia, my understanding is they've expressed some interest in getting engaged uh, with future vertical lift. Um, and given the type of ally that they are, that's that's one answer. If it's somebody else, it's a different answer because of what Chris just talked about. Uh, additionally, dependent upon when they're involved, are they a pure FMS customer that's getting a, a, an end product, which is goodness for the U.S. for interoperability and, and total affordability. Uh, on the, the front end piece, that can be a uh, double-edged sword, uh, especially with how difficult it is for us, if we, even if we have a joint program, trying to get requirements, stability, and meet everyone's needs. If you get a, an international partner and uh, their needs are, are not aligned with uh, where you want to go, it may look really good from an affordability standpoint if they're bringing dollars, but uh, it, uh, the requirements harmonization becomes uh, more challenging. Keith, thanks. Uh, next question, uh, Colonel von Eschenbach, maybe you could answer this one. Uh, and anybody else who's interested. Are we looking at IBM's Watson for aviation maintenance? If so, uh, or I would add, are some kind of capability similar to that maybe? If so, where are we uh, as an enterprise on this process? And that's from Sergeant Major Dove, Damo AV. Um, so th thanks, Sergeant Major. Good, good, good question. And, and oh yeah, and General Gabram will be more than happy to expound on that. But, so, but so on, on a uh, so let me get on the supervised autonomy kind of discussion that was earlier today, um, and I certainly think that applies to anything we want to do with condition-based maintenance or making the platform uh, smarter and then you know unburdening us from doing the, a lot more work from the soldier. But so it, a supervised autonomy is not the goal is not to unman the aircraft or to make an autonomous system but to make the system have a, what I like to describe as a sliding scale 
of, of intelligence to where you make it smarter. I mean, I, I wouldn't say you, the F-35 program has learned some lessons that when the aircraft lands and it starts ordering parts that you don't have or it grounds itself, probably not what we want to do per se. Um, <laughs> But I do think, you know, as we think about, and, and we've struggled with this. I mean, General Gabriel and I have talked about it, is we do, and, and as uh, Chris has said, we do have access to data coming off the airplane and in the future can glean gigabytes of data. But the question is, from a requirements perspective and an integration, what do we do with it and how do we, you know, turn that to our advantage? I think the capabilities are there. Um, certainly our future sustainment strategy you know, it depends on that technology, but how we do it, I think um, we're exploring the full dot model, the organization, the training, and the material solutions to, to make that happen. Great point. I'll leave that question for General Gabriel right here on that panel. <laughs> Next question. There's just fertile ground in that whole, <laughs> whole field can free up money from ONS budgets yeah. that could be directed to S&T and procurement. Uh, if you operated your fleet with, and I get that it's different, but the commercial world is flying and depending on that technology, yeah. and they've made enormous strides that you could readily leverage. Yeah, another great point. Uh, next question. What is the Army doing uh, in its way of research and development of electric or hybrid, hydro, elect, hybrid, sorry, hybrid electric propulsion and distributed electric propulsion and what should the Army be doing on those technologies? So I don't know. <laughs> I can tell you. It's a good question. <laughs> There's plenty of people, right, they can, they can tell us what. Um, Bill, have you got any, can you, any ideas? Yeah. Jump up, sir. Grab a mic. Thank you, sir. Uh, we're currently participating in the DARPA program that, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but it's a, it's a hyperelectric, it's a completely electric uh, aircraft that's got fans on the wings and the tail sections. Uh, they're working on those. A lot of the Green Skies initiatives that are in our international partners arena, they, they tend to focus more on hybrid electric designs. Matter of fact, Saffron's got an engine now that uh, they, they actually shut down one of the, uh, in, in their future aircraft, it's a single main rotor compound with pusher props on it. They actually fly it with one engine shut down. Uh, the rationale being that they have an electric system, right now a 60 kilowatt electric system, that they can st start the engine that shut down in less than six seconds to get it operational. Of course, my question at the Paris Air Show was, can I also use that for combat maneuverability, that additional hybrid electric propulsion? Uh, also in our RAS program, our small engine program for 200 horsepower and below, uh, hybrid electric is one of the candidate technologies that we're taking a look at. So clearly we're, we're chasing those, uh, those uh, opportunities as much as we can. Um, right now, a lot of the issues associated with the electric system, it has to do with uh, power loading of the batteries, uh, the, main, uh, the battery systems in there. A and we, we probably have to look for another 50% growth in battery technology to get us to where we need to for it to be a practical solution. Uh, probably a lithium metal solution is the earliest thing that we can take a look at. And that's probably 10 to 15 years out to get those kinds of batteries and incorporate them as a part of an overall hyperelectric program for, uh, uh, for um, our aircraft. So, sir, let me, let me just jump on that real fast. And I think that's a great example of kind of what I was describing before in science and technology. So if you would look in the year 2000, 2001, and three, when we're starting to really heavily employ unmanned systems in the early days of GWAT, you would have probably never guessed that in 2016, 17, when you realize our unmanned systems are heavily vulnerable to an A A2 AD kind of threat, and they now need to be more maneuverable and more survivable. And so the science and technology equation changes away from a long range, long endurance uh, kind of engine to a high power demand, you know, vertical takeoff and landing maneuverable, but then also retain those same qualities. So, I mean, that's a wicked problem to solve. I mean, that's, uh, that is a hard problem to solve, and I think that's where, you know, we appreciate the help from ATD and, and all the partners in ADD there. 
to, uh, to help us figure that out because our, certainly our unmanned systems, propulsion systems, are not as reliable as we'd like them to be, and they certainly don't have the power profiles that we believe are required for today and tomorrow. Tom, great insight also. We're down to uh, a little over two minutes. I would ask each member in 30 seconds or less any closing comments that you have. I'll start with Mike at the right side. Mike, any closing comments? I, no, I, I mean, we, we continue to need to work the science and technology to make sure that we're delivering the capabilities for the future to the warfighter. And, and being able to collaborate on that and make sure that we are investing in the right technologies and using our IRAD money responsibly and in a way that makes sense for the Army is why, why we're here and we need to continue dialoguing on that. Thanks, Mike. Chuck? Uh, one topic I thought was going to come up was cybersecurity, and I think it's a looming issue out there that we as industry government partners have not really figured out how to address. And, so I, I just urge us to all try to start bringing that to the front burner so that we don't find ourselves in a, in a mode where a big problem occurs and we're reacting to it and we're shutting a bunch of stuff down because we don't have another option, so. Great. Back on the 14th of December, <laughs> right? we're talking about cyber. Great point. Keith. Uh, for Bell, we're uh, very excited. We're literally uh, within days of uh, turning rotors on V280 with the uh, first flight to follow that. Um, and look forward to the opportunity to continue to work together over the next two years for uh, all these things we're talking about related to uh, reducing risk and concerns about where we enter the acquisition process. We're basically going to have a uh, flying lab to uh, continue to burn down risk and work with our uh, Amerdeck customers. And I appreciate being on the panel today. Thanks, Keith. Chris? Keep up the collaboration. Don't just focus on singles and doubles. Keep a couple of potential home runs in the portfolio. Colonel Von Eschenbach. <laughs> Jeff? Yeah, so it's a, it's a pleasure to be able to play on, on all sides of the fence, to be a part of the S&T community, to be a part of our program of record uh, project offices, and to continue to work hard. We're going to get our engineers inside of your plants, and we're going to do training with industry, and we're going to figure that out. The bureaucracy will not defeat us. I, I have some final comments, and I'm going to turn it over to General Todd for his final thoughts. But General Ham, General Swan, and General Gaylor, thanks for your leadership and for allowing this panel to be here today and running an event like this. This is certainly value added. And I want to thank all our panel members uh, for being a part of this, uh, this great event also. Uh, General Todd, any final comments closing it? Sure, I, I, I'll make it brief. Uh, again, General Phillips, thanks. Thanks so much for, uh, for handling us all up here. You've done a great job today. AUSA, again, well done. Uh, obviously, first one of these, fantastic venue. We look forward to continuing to support. Um, I will say this, you know, and Jeff mentioned earlier, you know, we need to put prototypes or smaller quantities or things like that. There are opportunities for us along the way as we learn to put, instead of a, a, what is typically a um, limited user test, in whatever quantities the testers decide are the right amounts, we actually ought to ask the user, do you need a battalion's worth? And there's a potential to put, and this is all risk-based. But if the risk is reasonable and the Army is willing to accept it, let's put a battalion's worth in the field. There's no reason not to. And that's prior to going to full test. So there are options there for us. We've seen that done in Africa. We've seen that done in the, in the Pacific on certain technologies out of, Jeff, your community. And I think it's working well. We can't talk about many of those in this room. But you need to know that that's working. And I think we need to have further dialogue about what's the right amount in the acquisition program that we need to procure early to provide some sort of initial capability before a traditional IOC. So that's, that's something that's happening. Um, another thing that was talked about earlier today was um, really integration. Uh, it would be nice if we could have a common A-kit a common way to do that. I will tell you we have done that on a platform today. I, I saw it. I toured it uh, about three weeks ago. It's on uh, a new fixed wing platform. Uh, we're putting what's called a sidecar on it, and it actually is a, a streamlined casing that allows for multiple sensors to be mounted via a common interface to that platform, both in hardware and in software, and it's quite unique. Uh, they have since changed those sensors, and there's over five different packages in that streamlined, doesn't affect drag or performance of the aircraft uh, system. So that sidecar concept is working. We look forward to taking that further, uh, sir, as you talked about, General Gaylor, into uh, our vertical lift platforms. And then lastly, um, 
it's important that we continue to upgrade and have the dreams to really achieve technology that's going to pr provide us overmatch in the future. I think one of our great commercial uh, partners calls it moon shots and roof shots. You got to do both. You got a dream, you got to take the shot at the moon, but you got to maintain the house you're in simultaneous. So as we move forward, S&T is not just about one or the other, it's about both. And we look forward to continuing to partner with all these uh, folks up here, you in industry, and uh, I can't tell you, I can't wait to see what the future holds. So thanks again.